Good afternoon and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We're live streaming from the Boathouse at Confluence Park and we're very happy to have you with us. My name's Jane Scott and it's a privilege to serve as President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club and to welcome you here today. There's only a few of us in the, in the audience here at the Boathouse, the speakers and the production team and me, so we're very, very happy that you're tuning in. Today's forum is a special one for the Metropolitan Club. Every year we celebrate the Harrison Smith uh, Legacy Fund, and as part of that celebration, we're happy to invite the Downtown Commission to present the annual Smithy Awards. And with us today to do the honors is Bob Leversedge of the Columbus Downtown Commission and also an architect at Schooley Caldwell. So Bob is gonna join us virtue of a video. So Bob, the podium's yours. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bob Loversidge. I'm a member of the Downtown Commission. I'd like to thank the Columbus Metropolitan Club for giving us this opportunity to talk with you about the Harrison W. Smith Award presented by the Columbus Downtown Commission. The commission would not exist without the vision and leadership of Harrison Bill Smith. In 1997, when we started, we had a progressive and comprehensive zoning approach one that views demolition as an occasional need rather than a right, and one that includes a rigorous architectural design review process for all downtown projects. Since that first meeting in 1997, the commission has reviewed about 1,500 applications representing about $6 billion in investment in our downtown. We, 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 we partner with um, applicants to produce projects that advance Bill's vision of progressive development, inspiring design, and a cohesive downtown. And it's with gratitude and respect for Bill's leadership that the Downtown Commission established the Harrison W. Smith Award. The award is given annually. The prize recognizes individuals, projects, or organizations that positively impact our downtown and reflect Bill's drive for an ever-improving urban environment. We've attempted to raise the bar in architectural and urban design in our city. When you look at this list of projects that have received the award, you see that they, they've had a profound impact on the environment and the urban uh, setting of downtown. From 2010, when we awarded the Arena District an opportunity to reinvent an entire quadrant of our city, the neighborhood launched uh, the reintroduction of high quality housing into our downtown. Each of these projects has had a, a genuine uh, positive impact on the city, right up to last year's award winner, the Michael B. Coleman Government Center over by City Hall. It's my privilege now to announce the 2020 Harrison Smith Award, which goes to Mitchell Hall, the School of Hospitality Management and Culinary Arts at Columbus State. This building impressed the commission on a number of different levels, not the least of which is the way it's cited. You know, we've been watching Columbus State over the years uh, in a very thoughtful and appropriate response as they've expanded. Each time they expand, they've made a better connection to the city. None better than this building, which has four fronts and no back, no place to hide anything. But each of these facades makes a different statement of connection, connection of the students to the campus, connection of uh, students to the outdoor classrooms and gardens, connection of uh, this building to uh, the busy urban setting on Cleveland Avenue and so forth. We were very impressed with the way this building um, blends in with the architecture of the campus and yet makes its own statement uh, of quality on Cleveland Avenue. And what happens inside this building is going to be amazing. There are kitchens and laboratories, there's a restaurant, there's a bakery, there's a theater, there's conference rooms, there's indoor and outdoor classrooms and even a production garden. I can only imagine that students that go through this program are going to, in their own right, raise the bar on the restaurant and hospitality culinary experience that we have here in our city and region. Hot off the press from Brad Kankanoff, here's a photograph of the completed building. You can see that it, it uh, is an elegant, simple, transparent, uh, and appropriate response to, uh, uh, to our urban environment. And these renderings of the inside show an open, transparent 
and vibrant space that connects the, the different teaching laboratories and opportunities in a way that you can see what's going on and also creates an indoor street to connect the city uh, to the campus inside. And the smells and the sounds and the colors of the food that are coming out of this kitchen uh, can only inspire us uh, for, for the future. This is what the actual award looks like. It's a framed uh, certificate with a graphic of our downtown, the signatures of our mayor, Andrew Ginther, and our commission chair, Stephen Whitman. And we try to make sure that we recognize as many of the participants in these important projects as we can. So here, the Columbus State Community College is the owner, and I believe in the audience today, we have Dr. David Harrison, the president of Columbus State. We have Chef Joss Wickham, the director of the School of Hospitality and Culinary Arts, and we have uh, Cameron Mitchell, all representing the college. And Design Group, the architects that created this building, represented today by Lauren Eisen, Jeff McCambridge, and Ben Niebauer. Uh, we also recognize the landscape architects at MKSK, the construction manager at Kilbane, the owner's representatives uh, from Alfred, Corda, SMBH, EMH, and T at Wasserstrom for their uh, significant contributions to this building, and of course, the Cameron Mitchell restaurants. Uh, these are the people that, uh, and the organizations that made this, this fabulous project possible. Uh, this is, as I said, a, 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 an award from the Columbus Downtown Commission, and normally we attend this meeting, all of us, in person, uh, but that not being possible this year, uh, I want to recognize Stephen Whitman, our chair, Otto Beatty, our vice chair, Jana Maniachi, Mike Klusk, Danny Palomar, Ted Hardesty, and Tony Slanik. Uh, this is a unanimous selection by the Downtown Commission and uh, we offer our, our congratulations and our thanks to the people that do these projects and make our city a better place. A special thanks today to Louis Tiba, the staff planner who uh, keeps us straight and uh, makes sure we, we follow all the rules and keeps us organized. And uh, we really appreciate his help. So congratulations to all of the people that made this project possible. And uh, we'll see you again next year. Thank you, Bob, and congratulations to the winner, Columbus State, Mitchell Hall, and the others that were involved with this project. Uh, it's indeed a worthy project, and the Metropolitan Club is very, very happy to host uh, your award program every year. Conversation moves us forward, and members power our conversation for the Metropolitan Club. We'd like to invite you to consider becoming a member of CMC and joining in the support to help us keep the conversation going. You can learn more about the Metropolitan Club, register for events, join CMC, or renew your membership, or make a donation anytime at columbusmetroclub.org. Today's forum is sponsored by Smith & Hale and ACOM. Live streaming is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. We're very grateful for their support. We'd also like to thank those of you who are watching today who purchased a virtual seat. We are really, really appreciative of your continued support and it, it helps us to continue the live streaming in large part because of that support. Thank you all very much. Today's forum, the World Health Organization notes that green space is an important part of the common services provided by a city and it serves as a health promoting setting for urban residents. It's necessary to ensure that public green spaces are easily accessible for all population groups and are distributed equitably within the city. To discuss the role of green space, so let's welcome our speakers. Executive Director of Franklin County Metro Parks, Tim Maloney. Community Relations Chief of the Columbus Recreation and Parks Department, Sophia Fifner. Vice President of Planning, Architecture and Real Estate at The Ohio State University, Keith Myers. And hosting today's forum, Chief Operating Officer of the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation, Amy Taylor. Amy, would you like to have the podium? Thank you, Jane. I appreciate that. Um, 
One of my favorite quotes is, parks and playgrounds are the soul of the city. And I think if that's true, we have a wonderful soul here in Columbus. I'm proud to work with the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation, an organization that believes in green space and believes that green space is the catalyst for development. In the past 10 years, we've seen an explosion of premier award-winning green spaces here in downtown, uh, mainly through public-private partnerships. The panel today represents those partnerships, and I'm so thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about them. Um, in the past, parks have been a place of gathering for thousands. I remember just last summer being with 7,000 of my closest friends at the Boys to Men concert at Columbus Commons. But that's not where we are in 2020. 2020 has brought a lot of interesting things to our lives, but one silver lining has been the use of parks. And I'm thrilled to be able to hear, be here today to talk about the different purposes that parks play in this year and how we envision them moving forward. Uh, so panel, I'd like to start with Sophia, re representing the city of Columbus. Um, with more than 400 parks, the city of Columbus has demonstrated a strong commitment to providing green space across so many neighborhoods. Why do you guys think parkland is so important? Yeah, well, foremost, one, thank you so much for inviting uh, Columbus Recreation and Parks to the table. I'm really excited to represent the department, and I can't agree more that heart, that parks and playgrounds are uh, the soul of the community. We actually have 164 playgrounds, so I absolutely agree. When we think about parks, they truly are a gathering place for so many residents. It's where residents connect with one another. Our mission is that we connect the people of our community through the power of nature, wellness, and creativity, and they can find that in our parks. But when I talk about parks and the importance of them, I typically focus on the three E's. One, the economic value of parks. So parks and park professionals add $166 billion of economic activity in the United States every single year. They're incredibly important to our economy. They promote tourism and visitors to different communities, including here in Central Ohio. From an environmental standpoint, I think it's 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 pretty obvious the importance of having parks and trees and our urban canopy, protecting wildlife, or having clean air and uh, a, a great space to connect with others and most importantly connect with nature. But then the last E is equity. And I think that that's something that's incredibly important to the city of Columbus and also to our department. Um, our parks are open for all. That means that regardless of where you live, regardless of who you are, we want every single resident in Columbus to have an equal access to our parks. They promote folks gathering together from different communities. It reduces crime. It promotes the well-being and development of children. So parks are, are wonderful, and I'm so excited that we have a great atmosphere for parks and green space here in Columbus. Yeah, it, it really does take a community, and a park brings the community together. Um, Tim, Metro Parks are one of my favorite places. I, I always tell Tim Maloney with Metro Parks that uh, I love going to my own Metro Park Glacier Ridge. But people are sometimes unaware of all the metro parks and all the investment metro parks have made right here in downtown, including being a partner in Columbus Commons, the Scioto Greenways, and of course the, the Whittier Peninsula Metro Park. And you've got a new metro park coming on board. I'd love to hear more about what's on Metro Park's plan and how you're seeing the changes as the community is, is changing. Well, you let loose with the biggest secret of all. Nobody knew that Glacier Ridge is your personal park. <laughs> uh, that was supposed to be a secret, Amy. Uh, it, 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 I'm gonna go off script here. Uh, Metro parks are kind of the greatest non-secret there is in central Ohio. Um, to follow up Sophia a little bit, you know, while COVID has impacted every single person globally, uh, we've seen our parks be that bastion of, of calmness. And in Metro Parks alone, we've had a 30% increase in our attendance, which that's just a percentage, doesn't mean a lot. That's 2.8 million more people have gone into the park. Frankly, it's Amy, 137 of those 2.8 million times. We, we have a chip on you. We keep track of you as you come and go. But we've had over 13 million people go to a metro park this year. Uh, and, you know, to tie into your question a little bit, one of those metro parks that has been key to this is Scioto Audubon, just downstream from us that, you know, 15 years ago was an impound lot, a closed Lazarus warehouse, uh, 
offices for rec and parks that were just one good windstorm away from falling down, <laughs> and really a, a place that inappropriate things were going on after hours. And uh, through the vision of Central Ohio leadership, Mayor Coleman, Metro Parks leadership, I wasn't there, so I'm taking no credit for it. And, and really the commitment from the, the community and the business community put in a park downtown. That then, you know, snowballs into the Columbus Commons, which, uh, you know, sitting here with Sophia today and, and uh, you, Amy, that doesn't happen without these partnerships. And then, you know, a crown jewel, the Scioto Mile or the, you know, the Greenways. How many hundreds of thousands of people a month, not a year, are taking advantage of these spaces? And, and especially with COVID, with you can't go to the mall, you don't go to movies, you're not going to the bowling alley, where can you go? Well, I'm really proud to say that every day of COVID, we've been open and we've been ready for you. And I can't thank our staff enough because they're the ones getting there, making sure the parks are clean, safe, and ready for everyone to use. I, I can't agree more. In fact, you know, we manage Columbus Commons and we've seen changes occur for the type of people who are using it because so many people who live around the commons are now actually using the park during the day. They're walking their dogs, they're doing that safely, they're being very respectful to the park. And they were so grateful to our team who's been keeping the park looking in great shape that they made them homemade masks and they brought them homemade goodies. And so what I've seen is that COVID has given us a chance as as people who manage parks and who think about parks to engage with our patrons in a different way. Um, Keith, a lot of the parks that we've mentioned, you've been directly a part of because you were uh, an amazing influence and designer with uh, MSI and MKSK. But now at Ohio State, you're a custodian of some pretty um, traditional parks. I mean, the Oval, I'm not sure it gets more traditional than that. Mirror Lake, anyone who's been to Ohio State has memories of those. How do you think parks can stay fresh while, while maintaining that balance of tradition and memory and nostalgia? Well, that one's um, difficult. Probably the um, uh, classic example of trying to deal with both those issues was when we um, had to redo Mirror Lake a few years ago. Um, Mirror Lake um, that we started with was really a product of the um, some work done in the 30s where it had a um, pretty hard edge around it and a brick bottom that was installed. Um, we created a much more sustainable approach to Mirror Lake. Um, it, it looks quite different, but it, um, and in some ways it's still the same. It's still Mirror Lake. It still um, is one of the classic landscapes at Ohio State, one that people remember. I think you mentioned the two. Um, we don't really have, um, perhaps the library with the exception, we don't have really, you know, buildings um, that are memorable to all the students. Different, you know, different colleges have buildings that people spend a lot of time in things, but the, the Oval and Mirror Lake um, are sort of sacred landscapes to all of the alumni and students at Ohio State. I agree. Um, when, we were, when we were brainstorming about the 2010-2020 downtown strategic plan, um, the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation, the City of Columbus, and, and MKSK, MSI came together and tried to figure out how to create a space that would be important using our riverfront. We were just getting ready to finish up the Scioto Mile, which is an amazing, iconic, award-winning park, but we needed something, we needed to deal with the river, which was the big pink elephant that the Scioto Mile didn't address. Keith, can you tell me a little bit about your thinking as we went through that journey for the, the river to really create that Scioto Greenways? And then definitely Tim and Sophia jump in because it was because of your organizations that the great idea uh, could really occur and that partnership with CDC could happen. Well, <clears throat> we've been curious um, for quite some time as to, um, what would happen if we took the Main Street Dam um, out of the river? And um, <laughs> as it turned out, um, it was the uh, deep recession in um, 08, um, and we had a lot of time on our hands. <laughs> so um, we decided to look into it, so we um, called our friends at emh and 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 Miles Hebert in particular, and. Um, we all got together over a period of about a week or two and um, 
you know, really dug into what might happen if we were able to take that dam out. We knew it had no utilities in it and it was possible. And um, it was through that effort that um, we discovered that um, by removing that dam, we could create 33 acres of open space along um, both banks of the river. And, um, and hopefully the idea was to uh, transform um, downtown and transform the riverfront. Um, it was kind of a crazy idea, really. <laughs> um, but as we looked around, we kept asking people, why is the Main Street Dam there? And nobody knew. Um, it clearly wasn't there for flood control and things. And um, so we have our own theories. Um, you know, we traced it back, you know, until the early 1800s. But um, it's, uh, it was really um, an attempt to build on the work we'd done on the side of Mile and really create a, um, a Grant Park or a Central Park um, for the city of Columbus. What I love about that park, <clears throat> in addition to really looking at the, the scape behind here, I'm not sure how many of our viewers can see, but behind the, um, the panelists is a, a, a feature of the Scioto Greenways and the riverfront. And I can guarantee you that prior to the Scioto Greenways, to taking down that dam, we're creating 33 acres of green space, um, you know, 75,000 plants, 800 trees. That would not be the vista that would be behind at the, Colum at the Columbus Metropolitan Club. We would have had a different viewing. But it changed the way that we showcased our city, which I think actually then changes the way we think about our city. Sophia, could you share some of your thoughts about how parks and landscapes can really make a city great? Absolutely. One of the things that I don't think uh, people necessarily think of when you're thinking of parks is a space for uh, cultural arts as well as science. And I think that our green spaces are a great location to elevate ex exactly that. You know, the Scioto Mile, you know, before you know, it existed, we didn't have a, an outdoor space where performing arts groups could perform on the bicentennial stage. We didn't have a large space for great cultural events like the Kosai Science Festival or the, uh, you know, the arts festival, and now we do. Um, and I'm really excited that our parks can serve as that, that space for folks to elevate the arts, to elevate science, and co to connect. And uh, Tim, we've talked about some of the parks that you guys have been part of downtown, including Columbus Commons, Scioto Mile, Scioto Greenways, and the, the Whittier Peninsula. Can you tell me a little bit more about the new park that you're building just a stone's throw away from downtown called Quarry Trails? Yeah, and I think it, it fits right in with the, what we're talking about now. It's activating the rivers. So Quarry Trails is just a few miles up the Scioto River from downtown. And really, its story begins back in the 1800s when we were building Columbus. We found limestone all up and down the Scioto River. And at one time, that quarry right there was the largest quarry in the world. And so these stones built Ohio Stadium, built the State House. They really told the story of how Columbus were, was to develop. And we ended up, we meaning the Central Ohio community, with a big hole in the ground. And what do we do well with a big hole in the ground? We fill it with trash. And that kind of is the story of part of Quarry Trails, is the, the revitalization of space that was deemed unusable. So about 70 acres of that 600 acres was a landfill. And through efforts between uh, Wagenbrenner Development and Metro Parks in the city of Columbus, we're able to restore that land, not to back what it was, but to new uses. And, and we really are excited about the new park. Uh, several hundred acres of land within five miles of 350,000 peoples, uh, gonna be connected to downtown Columbus via the Scioto Trail. Uh, waterfalls, rock climbing, mountain biking. Uh, there's going to be a white water element in there. There's a waterfall that's just unbelievable. Th that alone, it makes it a great park. But what I think the story really tells is how we've partnered with private development in there. And inside of a metro park is going to be a vibrant neighborhood or mixed use development. So it's not just going to be apartments or houses. It's going to be people living there, people working there, people playing there, restaurants, uh, places you can get business done. Maybe your office is going to be located there. It really is going to be, I, I think, something for the world to come take a look at. And it, it's great to be sitting here in front of all of you because that's how it happened. It, it really is the Columbus way of getting things done and making something special. 
You're so right, Tim. You mentioned public-private partnerships, the partnership that you are seeing with Quarry Trails, the partnership that we saw with you when Columbus Downtown Development Corporation, the Metro Parks and the City of Columbus came together to, to really do the greenways and all the other partnerships that take place to, to make these great things happen. What I love about some of the conversation, though, is that we're talking about reclamation. We reclaim 33 acres from the river to create Scioto Greenways. You guys are reclaiming hundreds of acres that were 70 acres of that was a quarry and a big hole in the ground to make it usable space. You reclaimed what happened over at the uh, Scioto Whittier Peninsula Metro Park. And I think all of that tells us that that the way things look right now may not be the way things always look. So if we're, we're talking about that and on that subject, a lot of the conversation that we've had so far has been about how we've been using parks and it was a really strong way to develop parks to create uh, economic development and inclusion and equality. But what have we seen happen this year with 2020, knowing that people are using parks in different ways? Um, Keith? What, what are you guys seeing at Ohio State? Uh, are, are, is the oval still being used as, as it was in my days there? Well, well every now and then. <laughs> you know, it's, um, no, I think it's um, uh, clearly, I think people have rediscovered parks. They've rediscovered the areas of campus. They've rediscovered parks um, across the region. Um, and people are spending a lot more time in them. And Tim's statistics about the numbers are, um, you know, frankly startling, a 30% increase. I'm sure there are plenty of people who never knew where Blendon Woods was, um, and um, they're spending a lot of time in them now. I, I wonder if it's going to lead to um, a greater appreciation, in fact, a resurgence um, of um, parks as um, an important part of the um, civic structure of any city or region. Um, there was an era in this country um, shortly after Central Park was built where we spent, you know, 30, 40, 50 years uh, building great park systems all over the country. Um, Buffalo, Cleveland Metro Park System, the Emerald Necklace. Um, and it, it just strikes me that um, people are um, realized through this, um, this epidemic that uh, how important um, these spaces are to a community and, um, and that value um, I think may translate, I hope translates into um, uh, further development of um, a lot of park spaces. Yes, absolutely. You know, not only have we seen, a, seen an increase in park usage in all of our parks, uh, but we've also seen a greater appreciation for park beautification projects. We have over 14,000 volunteers that engage with our department every single year, and I'm so excited that in Columbus, we've seen that partnership continue. Uh, whether it be corporations or individuals, we've found socially distant ways to enhance our parks and to enhance the experience for all of our residents. And then on top of that, you know, our department has become ground zero for a lot of, of uh, distribution services related to COVID. You know, we have parks right next to our community centers where we've been distributing masks. You know, last week we spent the entire week distributing over 3,000 meals um, to individuals in need because we wanted to make sure that while, you know, some folks are visiting the parks for recreation. We are also a beacon of hope and a, a space for folks to, to receive essential services as well. And I would be remiss to, to forget to mention the produce drops that have been happening in our parks near our community centers. Um, yeah, you know, our summer camps, this summer was transformational for a lot of parents, working families and, and, and children throughout the community. And we used our park spaces as an open way for kids to gather and still receive recreational services um, during a really critical time. So while park spaces uh, have seen an increase in use, they've certainly seen a lot of really positive, positive usage in response to COVID. It's almost as if parks are going back to some of their original foundings, you know, that, that Olmstead idea that parks are for everyone and, and really can, can create connections when you're, you're providing food and mass drop off and all the things that people are needing so desperately. We've seen uh, Columbus Commons specifically to be used as a respite. Uh, and, and it's interesting for me to say that because when we built it, when we tore down city center and we created the park, one of our big ideals was to create a 
200, you know, event, 200 events every event season to bring communities down, to bring families down. And we had to really take a step back because not only was that not appropriate to do, we didn't want to be the, the reason why people were, uh, were getting sick. We wanted to be a respite. And so what we found is people have engaged with the park as it's been appropriate. They're, they're walking their dogs, they're coming out and doing very spaced out fitness, um, trying to get a little bit of normalcy back in their lives. And I think that's one of the best things that parks can provide during this time. Tim, you've given us a lot of great figures. Are there any special stories that have occurred over the past 2020, past year that you wanna share? Yeah, so I think anybody who's been in Columbus knows traditional usage of parks. And, and you kind of mentioned it, Amy, where you talked about going back to our roots. When you visit a park, you, you kind of saw that evolution to where it went from this passive recreation, I mean, go way back in time when cemeteries were our first parks. Then, you know, more and more active community centers, all this. COVID's kind of thrown a different look at us. And what we're seeing in our parks is individual usage has gone off the charts. And what we mean by that is it's you by yourself or you and your family, or maybe you and your neighbors are meeting up to walk on our trails. Mm -hmm. But the, what's surprising to us, and we've seen a decline over the past 10 years or so, picnicking and picnic tables and the need for those. No, that we can't put in picnic tables fast enough. And all you have to do is go to a park any time around breakfast time, lunch time, or dinner time. And we're full with people outside eating again. Uh, the funny story is, generally, you can catch up on some you know, late work when it rains. Not this year. Rainy days, people are coming to our parks, sitting in our parking lots, in their vehicles, and looking at the views. They are there at the gates when we open at 6 a.m. because they want to be the first one in because that's their form of social distancing. Or we're getting ready to close the park and it's an hour or so after dark, but they like to be there and we have to go find them out there because it's their way of social distancing. Uh, right back to you know the staff, we've embraced all of that. We understand that the people are really taking advantage of these parks and we're excited to kind of evolve with them and see, and you, know, you kind of mentioned the 200 events at the Commons, wow. What a 2019 idea. That's an attempt at humor. Everyone at home start to laugh. I'll pause. <laughs> However, really looking at it, 200 events times a couple thousand people, that's a good crowd. It, you know, it's a little bigger than what Keith has on a Saturday for a football Saturday. <laughs> but what hit me this year is the numbers of people going to Sophia's parks and Metro parks is 20, 30, 50, 100 times that. People are recreating at their schedule. Amy, I know you like going to Glacier Ridge in the morning, back to that microchip <laughs> we have planted in here. And you see people at, in the morning. Mm -hmm. There's a 10 o'clock crowd, there's an 11 o'clock crowd. There's a, oh, I don't have a Zoom meeting, I'm gonna run over to the park at one o'clock. It's, our parks really, and I, I sound like, I am bragging, I, frankly, I am bragging. Our parks have been there at all moments in time. Go on the Olentangy Greenway at four o'clock tomorrow morning. There'll be somebody on the Olentangy Greenway at four o'clock tomorrow morning doing what they need to do. It, it really has been refreshing for all of us. I think that's a great word, refreshing, because it's almost like we're hitting a reset, thinking about parks differently. Um, parks are gonna be all the, the, three, the three E's that you mentioned. Can you repeat those, Sophie? I know it was... Yes. Uh, economic value of parks, the environmental impact, and as well as a, a place for equity. And, and I, I think it's always going to be that. I think maybe how we're viewing them might be a little different. Um, we've always said that uh, you build a park and they will come. Build a park and not just they as in the patrons will come, but oftentimes the development. Tim, you mentioned it with your new metro parks. It's going to be a neighborhood anchored by a park. Columbus Commons, neighborhood anchored by a park. All the investment, $400 million, which has occurred between Scioto Mile and Columbus Commons since those two parks came to be. And then, of course, what's going on on the peninsula, which in a lot of ways was started with the Greenways and the Dorian Green Park just west of Kosai. So we know parks are a great investment to make. I just don't think we understood that people were going to use them differently as, as the times have changed. How do you think, Keith, I'd love to hear your opinion, how do you think that's gonna change how we design parks, how the parks of the future, is this gonna be embedded or is this a blip? No, I think it'll change how we design parks um, quite a bit. Um, 
the one of the things that's always struck me is the um, of all the things you can put in a park, the single thing that people seem to love the most are just the trails. And um, you just I don't think you can have enough of them, um, particularly today when there's all kinds of um, wheeled vehicles and things uh, using the trails along with pedestrians and things. So I, I think that you'll see a lot more commitment to that. Um, I think that the um, sort of active parks and things will, there will always be a place for those, but I'm not sure that, that um, that's going to be as predominant as um, uh, more passive uses and things. Parks are useful in really sort of decompressing, you know, an urban area. Um, so I, I think it'll change, it'll change how, how the designs happen. Um, hopefully it leads to more connectivity you know, between the parks and um, uh, between the community. I think that's so true. So, and Keith teased it perfectly. You know, the traditional model, Frederick Law, Olmsted, whoever you want to go to, you know, draw a nice square rectangle, depending on your audience, how big that square rectangle can be. And I really believe that is changing, and it's exactly what Keith said on trails. The linear spaces are what people take most advantage of. Whether you're on a trail, whether you're on a stream, whether you're on a river, you know, I mentioned the Old Tangy Trail. A million people go up and down that trail a year. A million. We have Sharon Woods, great park, amazing park. It's a 600 acre square. There are places in, in Sharon Woods that human feet haven't touched in years. Because what do they do? They do the linear trail around the perimeter. And you asked a little bit about park design. I think that's where, especially here in central Ohio, uh, you're going to see park design change that we're going to start to embrace those linear spaces. And the, the beauty of this is, uh, by the way, secret time, turn your monitors off. A lot of those linear spaces are already publicly owned. They're owned by cities, they're owned by the county, they're owned by the state, or they're pieces of land that other development has set aside because they're in a, a floodway or a floodplain, but they're perfect for these linear parks. And to get back to equity, a lot of these linear spaces connect to neighborhoods that don't have great connection to park today. That's where I see over the next, uh, actually we're doing it in our office today. I know Sophia's office is doing it today. We're really trying to get to those places where we can connect to everybody. Yes, I'm so excited that, that trails were mentioned and connecting parks because that's exactly what the city is doing. You know, we have over 400 parks, which is wonderful, but equity is a huge driver for how we're planning for the future. And looking at a 10 minute walk to a green space or a park is incredibly important to our department. Uh, right now, about 60% of Columbus residents are within that 10 minute walk, and that's not good enough. We wanna make sure that every single resident has access to a green space. So we're looking at those pockets those trail connectors where folks can yet leverage our parks not just for recreation but also to get to work or to get to school safely uh, we're investing in strips of, of, of land that are publicly owned but we're also going to need a lot of private support as well uh, one of the things that we're looking at as we move forward into 2021 and beyond is our urban forest and our tree canopy um, you know the city owns just a small fraction of, of land here in central Ohio and in order in order for us to really invest in our, our parks, in our green space, in our trees, uh, it's going to take a team effort, not only from our, our public uh, public partners, but our private partners as well. Oh, I, I have to ask more about this this urban forest. Uh, what what are you guys thinking about that, and how would you define it? How can how can someone who maybe isn't as familiar with it really understand that? Well, one, you can visit our, our department's website to learn more about our urban forestry master plan. It's something that we've been working on for the past year. We've been working with residents as well as corporations, with uh, the public sector, the different departments within the the city of Columbus, um, community other community partners as well, to look at how many trees we have here in the city of Columbus. We're currently a heat island. Um, Columbus has does not have enough trees for our population. By 2050, I believe we're expecting a million more residents, and so it's really important that we invest in trees and have a long-term plan for their health. What types of trees need to be planted, uh, how we can maintain those trees, and how can we can create partnerships to make sure that um, we're planting trees not just on public land, but also on private land as well. 
Oh, that sounds great. It's very exciting. It does. All of these things sound exciting. Keith, you're not just at Ohio State uh, and a, a, a dean of planning around uh, the community, but you're also involved with ULI. And I know ULI has looked at equity in park, trying to make sure parks are close, trying to get a rapid trail system. Can you share some of the things that are on that forefront? Yeah, we're interested in, um, at the moment at ULI, um, we've been discussing with Tim and the management committee um, of the ULI, um, trying to explore an idea that would um, uh, create a unified uh, park system along all five major waterways in um, in central Ohio. Um, we're, we're very interesting. Um, if you look at a map of Franklin County, you'll see you know the Darby, the side of Olentangy, uh, Alum Creek, um, Big Walnut. You'll see them almost equally distributed across the um, county. And if you're able somehow to um, create a system of parkland um, through those areas, you would end up with um, an interesting um, distribution that um, would put a park within you know, a mile or two of almost every resident in Franklin County. It'd be pretty spectacular. Um, it's, a, it's a big idea. We're interested in exploring it. Um, and uh, hope to begin um, kind of poking around at that early next year. Well, that sounds great. So even though the study of parks has been around mm -hmm. a long time, it, it, it's refreshing to hear that it's, it's being looked at in a different way and that it's being looked at because things are changing in the community and what patrons want can actually influence what kind of parks are being you know, built, what kind of parks are being designed, and even what the designed parks are being used as. Um, w one of the big things when, when we did tear down City Center to create Columbus Commons is people really had this memory, and I think that's one thing that places can create, memories um, of holidays at City Center. And so we decided to try and and work with the city uh, who uh, manages Scioto Mile. We had just built and opened that at the same time and do this walking trail of urban lights. And even with everything that isn't possible this year, that is still possible. Um, Columbus Commons and Scioto Mile, uh, there's probably more than 600,000 lights between the two of them that you can come down, safely visit, do it in a car if that's what you feel more safe doing, and see um, see these beautiful lights and have and, and begin to create those memories about the holiday season. So we only have a few minutes left, but I guess I wanted to ask each of you, what's your favorite park or what's your favorite memory at a park? Tim? Well, obviously, because it's your park, Glacier Ridge. <laughs> no, you can't ask me what my favorite park is. That would be the equivalent of asking who my favorite child is. Actually, I have a favorite child, but I do not have a favorite park. Every one of our 19 parks is different. You've got to get out and see them. They all have a different flavor, a different feel, and there'd just be no way to say what your favorite one would be. Do you have a favorite memory then? Okay. <laughs> I, and I've told this story before, back in the third grade before I was permanently banned from field trips, but that's a whole different story. My little school, Our Lady of Peace, went to Sharon Woods in the third grade and they let us loose. And I'm gonna tell you, from that moment on, I was hooked on Metro Parks. Uh, Mom and dad are gone, so they can't punish me now. I used to ride my bike to High Banks from Clintonville. I used to ride my bike from Clintonville to Sharon Woods. I, it, it was just a place that I needed to get uh, to disappear. Sophia? You know, I, I think that my favorite memory definitely stems from childhood. I used to visit Blacklick Metro Park as a kid and climb trees there. So uh, parks have been a long part of my family story and my history. But I actually took all of my engagement photos at Topiary Garden, which is one of my favorite parks. I feel like it's a hidden gem downtown. And if you haven't been, I absolutely recommend uh, a visiting. It's a beautiful park. The, the individuals in our department who take care of that park uh, do a miraculous job, and it's great to see all of the different people and um, uh, uh, animals as well at, at Topiary. I, I, I love that you mentioned Topiary. I do think it's a hidden gem. Uh, it's, it, for those of you who don't know, it's, it's just on the other side of the library, the Columbus Metropolitan Library main uh, building. And it, it, for me, has always felt like a fairy tale park. Like it could be filmed as a movie because the trees seem to go, grow in the opposite direction than what they should. There's a pond. PBJ and Jazz has been done there for years. And I'm so glad you mentioned it. It's a beautiful park. Keith? 
Well, I've, in terms of memory, I grew up in Cleveland, so um, I was always amazed at the um, the Cleveland Metro Park System, the Emerald Necklace, and we would go down into the Rocky River Reserve, and it seemed like you'd never come out of it when you were a kid. It was a whole um, wonderland. But really, my favorite park in Columbus is Topiary Park. Um, it's always been um, my favorite. I think it's um, a really special place, and um, you know, its design's reflective of its time, and it just, um, I've loved what the library's done to open itself back up and connect to that park. They did a terrific job, and uh, it's really nice. And it's one of the parks where it was there and then development is coming, unlike some of the other things I've talked about where the park was there first, um, with library park apartments and what's going to go on with motorists uh, and a, a host of other neighbors that have been there for a long time. I think Topiary is interesting. I, I, I It's a hard time. I'm like, uh, Tim, I'm not sure I could pick a favorite um, pick a favorite park, but I, I do remember my daughter was one of the first kids to go through the um, the, the amazing world-class fountains at Sayota Mile, and we were filming the video for the grand opening, and she went through it, uh, and so I think in some ways that, that park will always be so special to me, and that moment will be special to me. Um, well, we've had a really uh, great discussion. Is there anything I missed in the last minute that we have that you guys want to make sure to mention? Otherwise, I will turn it over to Jane Scott. Well, I'm uh, filling a couple of roles today, so I get to curate the questions that we have. Uh, Catherine Kelly, Ohio Manufacturing Institute at The Ohio State University asks, is there a balance between providing spaces for all and grooming a group of donors slash supporters who will fund special projects? Should park systems get into the pay to play business in this regard? As an example, Friends of the Metro Parks, of which I served as a board president in the past, struggled with whether to be a friend raising or fund raising organization. It appears as if it has veered towards the latter category in recent years. Well, I, I can't speak for Metro Parks, but for the city of Columbus, we always feel that there's a space for friends groups and volunteerism as well as fundraising. You know, from a, a philanthropic giving standpoint, Parks and environmental organizations only make up 3% of philanthropic funds, and funds are needed if we're going to have more park assets like benches and trees and all the things that make parks beautiful. But we need those friends groups as well to help us plant those trees, to help us beautify those, the landscaping and build playgrounds, so we need both. You know, Jane, if I could just <clears throat> jump onto that, because, um, you know, the um, Friends of Central Park really transformed that from what it had been in the, um, in the latter part um, of the of the 20th century into what it is today again. And one of the problems and one of the issues and the one thing that is a concern about, um, you know, the um, as we as park become more and more important in the development of the cities is funding. Um, and there has to be a funding model that um, uh, to maintain them after they're built and to build them themselves. But um, and that's where the friends groups, I think, are really going to be important. Um, cities, um, unless you know, unless they have their own levies like Metro Park and things, cities um, budgets go up and down, and when they go down, parks are first. And uh, we're fortunate, in Columbus, we've got a, a mayor and a council that are committed to parks, and it's not as much an issue here. But in other cities that I've worked. Um, it could be a real problem. So funding is critical. The friends groups, I think, are critical. Yeah, and so Catherine and I have had this debate many, many times. We are very fortunate to have the support of Franklin County residents. Uh, our levies historically do very well. We, we go right to the voter and say, we have a park system. Would you like to fund it? And we went up in 2018, and about 70 percent of the voters said absolutely, which then gives us a nice base to build on. But what about the extras? And that's kind of where we look at. The, the, the real extras are special. Can you use outside funding for that without jeopardizing that equitable? You know, the one, not the one, but one of the most amazing things about your metro parks, they're only open every day for everybody with no fee. You come in and do anything in a metro park that's open to the public, it's yours there every day for free. And, and that goes back to the funding, is it really free? Because in a sense, anybody who lives in Franklin County is paying a small amount of money to open and maintain those parks in perpetuity. 
as well as the residents of the state of Ohio. We get local government funding uh, from state funding sources. So when somebody does come down from Delaware County to visit Sharon Woods, they actually have contributed to that park as well. Well, I'm gonna ask a follow-up question to that. How do you determine the ROI on a park when you're beginning to develop a park? Um, as opposed to how many acres it should be, how big it should be, how many amenities. Uh, it, there's got to be a math behind this somewhere to kind of determine how much you can invest in any given property. So there is a textbook, and it's been republished many times with that exact math in there. And I think what we're seeing in, really in the 2000s and beyond, every park is unique, and you can't use that as the driving force for every decision. That, that's the same book that'll show you to draw and develop a rectangular park yeah. and to put a playground in this corner, to put a path in this side. And that's really not realistic anymore. So back to the return on investment. Is it being used? Right. C can you look at that park on a Tuesday afternoon and see people there? Is, you know, if, you know, we're both in the golf business. Are there people out on the golf course playing? On days like today where there's snow on the ground, are there people on the golf course sledding where they're not playing? Right. That's the real return on investment and not measurable, but how many smiles do you get? And if that, if you could invent a device that would calculate smiles, Sophia's budget would double. Yeah. Yes, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> for, for the city of Columbus, you know, we're really focused on making sure that we are building parks and amenities that meet the community's needs. So with our capital and our operating dollars, we're looking at what is the public saying that they want? What types of investments do they want in their local parks? Because many of our parks are neighborhood parks. They're parks adjacent to family homes or uh, small businesses. We get feedback from them and we try to invest our dollars uh, equitably across the city to make sure that we're, we're providing that resource for them. Alan Slaymaker, I'd like to hear from the panelists how they are incorporating climate action and resilience into their park planning and maintenance plans. Sophia and I could probably answer this question very similar. So to affect the climate, we know that green spaces, whether they're forests, whether there's prairies, whether they're just ways of capturing storm water in ways instead of just sending it downstream, exponentially help with that cause. Uh, between their give or take 18,000 acres, between our give or take 28,000 acres, you're 50 some thousand acres of land that is every moment pulling carbon dioxide out of the air and putting oxygen back into the air year round. We're keeping stormwater runoff from washing down our streams and taking away our topsoils. Uh, it's a great investment of any sort into whether that's that teeny little pocket park in Linden or whether it's 7,000 acres of land out on the Derby. Every day we do it. And for, for the city, I would share that, you know, our park systems for recreation and parks and all of the parks that we manage, we're part of a broader effort amongst the city of Columbus to focus on sustainability issues. Um, we work as a, t a team across the city to make sure that every time we're building a park, we're uh, fixing park land that we're taking the environment into consideration. And that includes our air, our, our land, and as, as well as our wildlife. Lafayette asks, one of my students in my class at the Glen College is doing her term project on the developing urban tree, land, tree canopy in Columbus. Um, you, also, you mentioned that, but I think Bill is looking for a little bit more specifics. Are there, is there a specific plan in terms of timing, um, the increased population by 2050, how many trees and who's going to plant them? Sure. So we're building the plan. Um, and that, I, you know, as a as a resident, the worst thing, the one thing that you don't want to hear is, we're building the plan. But sincerely, we want to make sure that this plan regarding our urban forest is long lasting. And it's not something that's just going to last five years. And then, you know, if a, there's a change in administration or a change in residency, that things just, that the city just drops the ball. Um, and by the city, I don't mean just the city of Columbus, but the city as in our, the city, our corporate partners, our community partners, OSU, et cetera. So it's a 50 year plan. Uh, we're just in the initial stages of it. So I'm hoping that if uh, that student wants to reach out to our department to become more involved, to help shape the future of that plan, we would love their input. Along to Bill, if he, I know he's watching today too. Um, Steve Swift, uh, is there any collaboration with the city and metro parks with the state park systems? Uh, I can speak for metro parks, but I directly heard the, uh, the 
Director of Ohio Department of Natural Resources and I work hand in hand on many projects, whether they're at a state level with funding, whether they're environmental issues. Uh, and really at the beginning of the COVID outbreak, we were in meetings and developing strategies of not only keeping our metro parks open, but how do we keep the state parks open and making sure that the messaging and how we operate those is, is very similar for our customers because we didn't want one set of standards at the state parks versus one set of standards at the metro parks. Yes, and for the city of Columbus, absolutely. There's there's a lot of collaboration. The the state actually allows us to provide um, provides us resources to acquire land mm -hmm. to help connect that last mile. You know, whether it be on trails or through parkland. So there's a lot of collaboration, whether it be on messaging, um, the acquisition of land, or even taking care of uh, wildlife in our parks as well and stocking our ponds for fishing. Jeff McKinney at Ohio University asks, what role do you see for green roofs? and green walls to supplement the value of green spaces. Keith, that might be a good one for you. Well, green roofs, um, for sure. Um, they were, you know, we, we evaluate that on almost every project that we do. Um, I think it'll have a huge impact. I think blue roofs um, in, in the future will um, also be important in terms of helping manage stormwater and things. So. Um, all of that, um, I, I can't really speak to green walls specifically, but um, I think, you, you know, in Europe, there's been a big commitment to green roofs for a long time, and I think you're going to continue to see that emerge here. And there, there's an interesting thing with green roofs because uh, Columbus Commons is a green roof. It's a green roof to the parking garage. Uh, the new Dorian Green Park uh, just west of Kosai is a green roof to a parking garage. So sometimes we think of green roofs as being like what's on the Lazarus building, which is eight stories in the air. But in Columbus, we've been able to figure out how to take underground parking and create that green roof on top of it. It has interesting challenges, but I think the opportunities far outweigh the challenges when we talk about that. So I have a question for you. Um, how can people feel more of a sense of ownership? Yes, we pay our taxes, but is there, are there ways that you really can sort of feel more ownership, short of Amy having her chip in the Glacier Park, but are there other ways that the public can be more involved? I love that question, and whomever asked that, I'm very excited. Uh, so, you know, our parks, they belong to the residents who we serve and the visitors who are coming here to Columbus. And the best way that folks can get engaged with our parks and feel more ownership is to volunteer. You know, yesterday was Giving Tuesday. Uh, it was a day to, you know, give financial contributions, whether it be $5 or $25 or your time to local organizations. But Giving Tuesday and uh, taking ownership of your parks also includes volunteering with us. Like I mentioned earlier, we have over 14,000 volunteers that volunteer as coaches for basketball games, for football games and soccer games. They volunteer to help us plant trees. And they also give uh, their, their financial contributions to help make sure that we can take care of every single park in every neighborhood. So uh, I think that that's a great way for folks to take more ownership of their parks and we would love that. Wonderful. Well, I see it up in my neighborhood with the Park of Roses. You know, those. Uh, I think that that park has more names of people with dedicated benches and dedicated roses that take care of that park. So thank you all so much. I hope everyone in the audience today found uh, this program enlightening. Um, Bastion for Calmness, 13 million people that went to Metro Parks, transformation in our city, and the reclamation of spaces. Those are words that I'll come away with and keep from today. So next week on Wednesday, Day. We're excited to learn more about robotics. We're kind of going from green space to mechanics here, I think. Amazing technology, an economic driver, and a creator of jobs for our, reason, our region. So we, we want to thank today's sponsors, Smith & Hale and ACOM, and our live streaming presenting sponsor, the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation, as well as the Columbus Dispatch and PNC. And online, our virtual seat patrons, thanks to all of you. You really do help us keep the conversation moving forward. And a very special thanks to our speakers, Tim Maloney, Sophia Fifner, Keith Myers, and Amy Taylor. We'd love to see you in this room again, but until then, please watch next week and stay, stay safe and well. Thank you very much. Thank you.